We come to Lecture 35 in our study of the life lessons that we learn from great books, and we continue our focus on what we learn about patriotism. Has patriotism been the subject of great books, which it of course has, and is patriotism still for us today what it was at the time of the American Revolution, or the American Civil War, or even World War II? George Washington stands before us always, as General Lighthorse Harry Lee said, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. And his farewell address is a call to patriotism. It speaks very little about war, because he knows that those who read his farewell address have been through that great trying period of war. But he focuses upon peace and upon the need for all of us to be Americans, not to be from the South or the North, not to be of the Republican Party or the Federalist Party, but to be all Americans. George Patton is the prime example of a man who identifies with this country, who loved it deeply, but who also found his greatest meaning in war. Like Washington, both Patton and those men who fought in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, I believe in World War II, all of these would have agreed that the noblest thing you can do is to die for your country. Had you been able to go back to the battlefield of Gettysburg and ask the men on both sides, what is the noblest thing you could do? It is to die for your country. If you had asked their wives and sweethearts, what is the noblest thing that can be done? It is to die for your country. It's an interesting question if you ask it today to an audience. And it doesn't just have to be an audience of students. It can be people in their 60s and 70s. Very few will actually raise their hands to agree that the noblest thing you can do is to die for your country. And yet Lincoln, in his letter to Mrs. Bixby, as in his Gettysburg Address, equated those who died for their country with the noblest of all sacrifices, that of Jesus. Now another very great American who believed that the noblest thing you can do is to die for your country is Theodore Roosevelt. And the more I study Roosevelt, the more convinced I become that he is one of the most successful presidents in our country's history, one of the greatest patriots, and one of the best authors. In fact, of all our presidents, he is the most voluminous writer, and his works still have enduring merit. John Kennedy, I think, was a very fine writer, and I think his profiles encourage even his Why, England's, Why, England, oh, Why England Slept are still very much worth reading. Richard Nixon's memoirs are interesting. Harry Truman wrote very spirited memoirs. But Theodore Roosevelt wrote some 20 volumes in the standard national edition, covering a range from American history, such as the War of 1812, through explorations of a river in Brazil, through comments on natural history, that is to say zoology, as well as an absolutely delightful and revealing autobiography. And I don't know if you need to read modern big biographies of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, go right to his autobiography, and you will find the character of that man on every page. And on every page, you will find a tribute to patriotism and how important it is, and of his debt to the great examples from the past, such as Washington, Lincoln, and Robert E. Lee. In fact, he will frequently say that Robert E. Lee George Washington and Abraham Lincoln are the three greatest Americans. Roosevelt was born into wealth, just like John Kennedy. He came from an old New York family, and some of the family members actually called it Roosevelt. And you'll find many Americans from the turn of the century who always called him Theodore Roosevelt. But we'll just call him Roosevelt for simplicity's sake. His grandfather still spoke Dutch around the table uh, and was a man of considerable wealth. And Roosevelt would never have had to work in his life. He deeply admired his father. Roosevelt was born in 1858, and his father was a wealthy man who basically gave his life to charitable works and to organizing charities. And Roosevelt said of his father in the autobiography, my father was the finest man I ever met in my life. Now, I like 
a person who says their parents are the finest people they ever met. That's real character to me, and I'm always dubious of people who lay all kinds of blame upon their parents. But Roosevelt, his father, was the finest man he ever met, and his mother was the finest woman. She was a Confederate. Unreconstructed, Roosevelt wrote of her. Her name was Bullock. You can still visit Bullock Hall in Roswell, Georgia, where she grew up. And um, when he was a little boy of about four, he would say his prayers every night and ask that God protect his relatives who were serving in the Union Army and his relatives who were serving in the Confederate Army, who were admirals in the Confederate Navy. So Roosevelt grew up to admire both the North and the South, and one of his most moving speeches was to the veterans of Vermont on the 40th anniversary of the beginning of the Civil War, in which he talks with such pride of the valor of the men in gray and blue and how our country had reconciled. And from the very beginning, with this Confederate and Union background, Roosevelt took a broad view of our nation, had a deep respect for ordinary Americans, and above all, believed that the course of our country's history was unique. And the Civil War itself was a statement of this uniqueness. This bitter war to rid our country of a moral wrong, and then at the end, Instead of vicious persecution, guerrilla warfare, the two sides reconcile. I think it is almost unique in the annals of history. Roosevelt went to Harvard. He was a fair student. He liked mathematics and history. Because he was sickly as a child with asthma and poor vision, he had had a series of tutors and had never quite gotten that firm foundation in Greek and Latin that the boys at Harvard who had gone to uh, private schools like Exeter and Andover had gotten. So he didn't like Greek and Latin that much, but he could still, as an older man, turn a Greek or Latin phrase. But he loved history, loved mathematics, graduated from Harvard in 1880, and thought about studying the law, which is what his father wanted him to do. But he said, you know, after a brief period of law school, I began to worry about the moral implications of being an attorney. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Both in the business world and in the legal world, that seems to hide a lot of chicanery. And the idea that a lawyer twists the law the same way a businessman may twist the, bu the business world in order to get a profit just struck me as something I did not want to do. And, of course, the great admired attorneys of our day, he said, were corporate lawyers, and they seemed to twist the law even more. So instead, to the dismay of my father and some friends, I went into politics. Now, you want a dirty business, they told me. It's politics. And New York politics in 1880 were very dirty. Machine, corruption. But I went into it because I believed you can make a difference. And if well-meaning patriots went into politics, maybe they would cease to be dirty. And he rose very rapidly. He was elected to the New York State Legislature and became a rising young star. But fairly early on, he made a principal stand. That is to say, he was part of the progressive unit, a progressive group within the Republicans, and they were for getting rid of all the old machine politicians. But the party nominated... Uh, James Blaine, and he was a corrupt politician, but Roosevelt said, we fought against nominating him. Now that he's been nominated, I will stand with the party. So all the progressives turned him down, and then his wife died. The death of his wife struck him so bitterly as a young man. They had a daughter, and she died shortly after the daughter was born, Alice, and Roosevelt could never think about his wife again. And he gave the little girl up to his sister, mainly to take care of, because even having her around was too painful for him. And he went out to the West, to the Dakota Territory. And without Dakota, I never would have been president, he said. And he ran a cattle ranch, still visited, out around Medora, North Dakota, out in the North Dakota Badlands. And his description in the autobiography, the little two-room cabin that he built, the cottonwoods blowing gently in the breeze, and living the life of a cowboy, and it was there he began to understand what made America special. And it wasn't the big law firms and businesses of New York. It wasn't Wall Street. It was ordinary Americans, the kind of frontiersmen he met in the day when he said the Wild West was still alive. Oh, 
sheriffs who carried two guns and couldn't quite remember how many men they had shot dead, going after a man who had stolen his boat, just pursuing him to show the man he couldn't steal his boat, capturing him, and then so far away from a town, he had to stay up 40 hours straight guarding the man to make sure he didn't escape or kill Roosevelt. And the whole time he read Tolstoy while he was watching this desperado. Now going into a bar room and he wore spectacles and this immediately set the tufts upon him, the local hoodlums. And this one came up to him, began to taunt him and said, you're gonna have to buy drinks for everybody. And Roosevelt said, well, okay, I'll buy drinks for everybody. Let me get up and do it. And then shot the man a strong right hook, laid him out cold and then went to bed. So that's the kind of life that he lived and won the respect of the cowboys. Oh, they were handy with the axes, particularly two of his old hunting uh, guides he had brought from Maine. And one of them said, he overheard them one day, how many trees did you cut down today? Well, I got 60. How many did you get? 47. How many did the boss get? Ah, uh, he beavered down 17. And Roosevelt says, if you've ever seen what a beaver does to a tree, you can see how different my wood cutting was from them. But I, I learned. And by 1889, he was ready to come back into the world. In other words, like other figures we've studied, he had to go away, be on his own, find himself. And he realized that his destiny did lay in politics. It is most interesting that this most unconventional of presidents was one of the, um, he was a real professional politician and civil servant. He became police commissioner of New York and cleaned up probably the most corrupt police force. He walked the beat with officers, learn which ones were really doing their jobs, which ones weren't, smell their breath to see which ones had been drinking, go into local brothels and find out what police officers were hanging out there, and he cleaned it up. He served on the Civil Service Commission, appointed by two different presidents to serve on the Civil Service Commission, and was instrumental in instituting a, an exam system. Now, Roosevelt said, an exam system does not solve everything, and there are offices in the Civil Service that probably shouldn't be filled by exams, but at least it was one way of getting rid of cronyism. So he got his hands dirty, and he got a lot of criticism, criticism for it. There's no way to get into bigger trouble than trying to reform a civil service organization, or indeed trying to clean up a police force. He ran for governor and lost, then was appointed assistant secretary of the Navy. And he was interested in the Navy. His first book, long before all this began, had been a history of the Naval War of 1812. Very fine study of it. He had studied deeply the teachings of Admiral Mayhem at the United States Naval Academy, who taught the overall importance of naval power. No nation had been a superpower without a navy, whether it was the Athenian democracy, the Roman Republic, or whether it was Britain itself. And France's failure under King Louis as well as under Napoleon was the result of their failure to be a naval power. And Roosevelt studied all of this deeply. And he had the good fortune, he wrote, that the actual secretary of the Navy was lazy and didn't do anything. And Roosevelt just took charge. And he began to reform the Navy, and he began to see that young officers coming out of Annapolis were promoted. And thus, he began to build up the United States Navy. And he began to be convinced that we had to go to war with Spain. And when the Maine was blown up in Havana Harbor in 1898, Roosevelt looked upon it as a great deliverance for him. The war against Spain, what we call the Spanish-American War, to my mind is a very good example of a just war. I frequently have people tell me, well, such and such a war is not just. Well, going back in our philosophical tradition, right back to St. Augustine or back to Cicero, a just war is one, a war that you undertake to protect yourself, or two, it's a war you undertake to protect your allies. Or three, it's a war you undertake to overthrow a corrupt government. And the colonial government of Spain was corrupt. It was very brutal in its atrocities against the Cubans who were trying to gain their freedom. And so we undertook, in Roosevelt's eyes at least, a just war. So we wrote for permission and said, can I form a United States volunteer cavalry unit? And he had as the officer in charge, Leonard Wood. They had struck up a very close friendship while he was there in Washington. And Wood was the commander and Roosevelt was second in command with the title of Lieutenant Colonel. And this was gonna be an unusual regiment. Um, and a request went out to territorial governors in places like Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma and Indian Territory, up in the Dakotas. We want men 
We want men who can ride and can shoot, and they're together in San Antonio. And so they came, cowboys from the plains, horsemen since they were little, crack shots, tough. And they were intermingled with football players from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, the best of the day, Roosevelt said. And they got along famously. First, they trained in San Antonio, where Roosevelt, who had served three years in the National Guard, and he said, this stood me in good stead. I knew how to drill them. I got them in good shape. In terms of marching, they could already shoot anybody out of their saddle. Then we went off to Tampa by train and then off to Cuba. And there on July the 1st, 1898, Colonel Roosevelt led the charge up San Juan Hill. They had been under heavy Spanish fire, and the Spaniards had a well-trained army, and they had better artillery, and they had better rifles than the Americans did. The Americans were still using old-fashioned Springfields. The Spaniards had the most up-to-date German Mausers, and they were laying down a very heavy fire upon the Americans. The regular troops were entrenched and didn't want to move out, and Roosevelt took his Rough Riders, his volunteer, his first U.S. volunteer, along with units of um, African-American forces, African-American soldiers. And he led them upward, and he asked the commander of the regular troops, can we go on and attack? And uh, the officer said, I don't have any orders to do that. Then Roosevelt said, will you let my men go through then? The officer said, well, I guess. And then his own men, the regular troops, got so upset that they went too. And so Roosevelt led them right up San Juan Hill, Kettle Hill, don't name from a big sugar kettle was there. In the face of very heavy Spanish fire, they captured it. And then Roosevelt led them to the next ridge. And San Juan, he said, was the greatest single day of my life. All those brave men attacking together and the thrill of battle. Like Winston Churchill... Roosevelt believed that there was a glory to war that could never be made totally sordid. So Roosevelt became a national hero. Came back, was swept into office as governor of New York. Now he believed deeply in progressive politics. He was a real Democrat, but in a, the Republican Party. He believed, one, in the recall you don't like what a congress congressman is doing, you don't need term limits, you just recall him. He believed in a national referendum. In fact, he believed that if the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional a law, the American people should hold a referendum, and if they decided it was a law, it would be a law. He believed in the income tax. He believed in the direct election of senators. He believed that our country was in the hands of large business interests who through their huge campaign contributions corrupted every aspect of public life. So he was not popular with a lot of Republicans. And as 1900 came around, the sort of the spin master of his day, Mark Hanna was his name, the great power behind the scene. He and the other real movers in the Republican Party decided what could they do to shut Roosevelt up? And, of course, the best thing was to make him vice president. That would ruin him forever. So he accepted under President McKinley to be the vice president. But 1901, McKinley was assassinated. Roosevelt had been on a hiking expedition with his family when he got the news. And suddenly Mark Hanna declared, that damned cowboy is in the White House. And sure enough, he was. And he began on a bold political program that would enable him to do more in office, probably, than any American president. And at the start of it was, of course, to clean up politics. And fr from the beginning to the end, he had deep support among ordinary Americans. Many of them voted Democratic in most cases, in places like Oklahoma. But they supported Teddy. He hated the name Teddy. His friends called him Theodore, but that's what the Americans called him, and that's good enough. It was Teddy. And he believed in giving them a square deal. He's one of the first American presidents to talk about health care. One of the first American presidents to talk seriously about Social Security. He's one of the first American presidents to talk seriously about welfare benefits. And he believed in a strong foreign policy. Our Navy was one of the weakest navies in the world. And when he left office, it was one of the strongest navies in the world. He thought we might never catch Britain, but we could certainly keep up with Japan and with Germany.
And he sent the great white fleet, as he called it, 16 mighty vessels on a tour all the way around the world. And in Japan, the Japanese saw the might of the United States Navy. But of course, there was one problem with having a Navy and being the United States. You had ships on the Atlantic coast. You had ships on the Pacific coast. And it was a long voyage around South America to bring them together. He believed that war was coming and the United States would probably have to fight not only in Europe, but against the Japanese. And for years, various companies, particularly French companies, had tried to build a Panama Canal. Well, Roosevelt got it done. Now, some people might catch some, cast some aspersions on the way in which Panama became an independent country, but it became an independent country, and the Colombian regime, as he showed in his autobiography, was utterly corrupt. There had been 52 insurgencies and riots in Panama in 52 years, all protesting against the Colombian government's corruption and oppression. And so they wanted to be free, we let them be free, and then he got that canal going. Despite yellow fever, terrible, diff terribly difficult terrain, that canal was built. And Roosevelt was there at its inception. Even going down, the first time an American president had actually left the United States during his term of office. And he went down to drive the big bulldozers because he loved publicity. He even loved the little teddy bear that people created in homage to him. And a foreign policy, he said, must rest on talking softly but carrying a big stick. Maybe the opposite of some more recent American foreign policy decisions. You had the strength. You didn't abuse it. But when you needed it, it was there. And the world listened to you. 1906, the Japanese and Russians listened to him. And he brought them to Portsmouth. And there worked out a peace treaty that ended the bloody Russo-Japanese War. And he received the Nobel Prize. In fact, Roosevelt is the only American president to receive the Medal of Honor. Now, he was nominated for it right after San Juan Hill, but he was too unconventional for the army and they blocked it. But later on, almost 100 years later, maybe 100 years later, he was granted posthumously the Medal of Honor. So he won the Nobel Prize in peace and he won the Medal of Honor. That's quite an achievement in itself. Then, at the height of his popularity, he declared in 1908 that he would not run again. Now, it was a decision that wounded him deeply. But in 1904, when he won the election on his own, in other words, he'd become president as, from being vice president, and in 1904, by an enormous landslide, in fact, it was difficult to even find a Democrat to run against him, he won this huge majority, but he turned to some newspaper men there in the, in the um, White House and said, well, that does it. I'm not going to run again. And he felt beholden to keep that promise. Now, can you imagine that today? But Roosevelt said, honesty is at the very heart of your life. And it was honesty that he admired in Washington and that he admired in Lincoln. His biography of Washington is short, but it is one of the most moving biographies. Washington, he said, was a man of complete honesty and honor. Not just in his public life, not just in keeping his word to others, that goes without saying. But he was honest with himself. He recognized his limits. He recognized what he could achieve. And to be honest with yourself sometimes is more difficult than to be honest with others. So he'd given his word and he stepped down. He really saw to the nomination of his successor, President Taft, 300 pounds of solid Republican, and he thought that Taft would continue his uh, program. But Taft, no, Taft was very much in the pockets of the big campaigners, the big campaign funders, and he was very much a man who believed that... Uh, the country should stick to business. So by 1912, Roosevelt was absolutely beside himself. He saw much of what he had gained being squandered, much of the New Deal and Square Deal that he had brought to Americans being passed away, and the country still not prepared for war. 
He had gone off to hunt in uh, Africa, and his journals of that trip it's themselves are marvelous studies in natural history and in courage and just in wit as well. But by 1912, he had had enough, and he wanted to gain the Republican nomination. Trouble was, the places where he was most popular, like Oklahoma, really didn't vote Republican in the primaries. So he lost. He had the great decision, and he bolted. He bolted the party. The Bull Moose Party, the newspapers called it. Its real name was the Progressive Party. And he stumped all around the country. It had been the tradition not to go out and campaign, but he went out and campaigned. One occasion, he was actually shot by an anarchist. And the bullet passed into him while he was speaking. Well, he was getting ready to speak. He was shot. It went into his speech, which was 50 pages long. He always had these long speeches, which he never gave. And then into his spectacle cases. So it penetrated a little bit into him. And, of course, his staff was there, going to take him to the hospital. He got up and said, now, I don't know if I can finish to the crowd, but I'm going to speak because I've been shot, as some of you may have heard. And went on for an hour and a half. Now, that's raw courage. And the American people admired it. But he lost. Woodrow Wilson became president. And the Great War came. And Roosevelt believed that Woodrow Wilson was the worst possible president. To him, Woodrow Wilson was the total hypocrite. And nothing is farther from a man of honor than the hypocrite. Cicero himself said that the hypocrite is the worst of all immoral creatures because he or she wraps himself in the cloak of honesty. And all of Wilson's speeches about being neutral in mind as well as in action. To Roosevelt, these were simply turning the back upon the important question. Germany was an immoral nation. Its attack upon Belgium had shown that the Germans had no regard whatsoever for the most fundamental morality and the treatment of the Belgians. So the United States needed to be on the side of Britain and France. And he spoke again and again, and his articles that he wrote at the time are virulent in their attacks upon the hypocrite Wilson. And finally, with the sinking of the Lusitania, with the Zimmerman Telegraph offering to give Mexico back the Southwest, America entered the war. And the final hypocrisy was Wilson's speech about leading this great and peaceful nation into war. And Roosevelt immediately wrote and said, I want to raise a unit of cavalry. And they chuckled over this in the White House, and he fumed and fumed. But his sons enlisted. In 1918, he got the word that his beloved son, Quentin, had died, killed in action, a pilot. And he never fully recovered from that, dying in 1919, only 60 years of age. But in his autobiography, and in essays like American Ideals, he leaves us a definition of patriotism, which, like Washington's, still guides us today. What does an American, Roosevelt ask? He is a patriot. And above all, he believes that it doesn't matter to what party a man or woman belongs. It is, are you a patriot? That is the question I ask. And do you put your country above parties? Do you put it upon above campaign contributions. He had very little use for the labor agitator, as he called it, the person who always was finding bad things wrong with America. But he had no use whatsoever, he said, for the businessman, whose only fatherland, Roosevelt said, is the till, whose only fatherland is the cash register, or the bottom line, as we would say today. Don't tell me you're a German-American or Italian-American or an Irish-American. I don't want any, I want any hyphenated Americans. We are all Americans. Come from wherever you want to, he said. But once you are here, you celebrate the 4th of July, not St. Patrick's Day. And then he believed deeply in the uniqueness of America. His book, The Winning of the West, is the highest tribute to the frontier and to the role of the frontier's man and woman in spreading democracy across the continent. He admired the Native Americans. He had lived among them. But he believed that the spread of American democracy and freedom was providential. He was willing to see us take control of the Philippines. 
because we would ultimately give them independence and ensure a tradition of freedom among them. So our country was unique as Washington was unique and as the ordinary American was unique. He epitomized his philosophy of life when he said life is like a football game. Hit the line hard, hit it fair, but hit it hard.